Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. We are back here again at St. John's College, and this is, I think, my second round in the president's office, but with a different president. We are here with the new president of St. John's College, Nora Demleitner. How are you today? I'm good. How about yourself? Good. Well, I understand that you just got in from out of town and you uh, narrowly escaped uh, some kind of airline held. (laughs) (laughs) Which we all live through these days. (laughs) That is for sure. But I thank you so much for inviting me into the office. And I'm sitting here looking at this Francis Scott Key desk again. And you were showing me a little bit about the bar. And this, gosh, dates back to 18... 12, 1806 in there. I'm not, the, I'm not the historian. But, you know, we wanted to introduce ourselves and to learn a little bit about the, our new president here at St. John's College, which, incidentally, is one of, if not the oldest college. Eh, it's not the oldest. I think it has the oldest roots, but it's one of the oldest na- colleges in the nation, right? It's the third oldest, actually, um, following the College of William and Mary Okay. Um, and uh, Harvard. Okay. So we're number three. And that's a shame. There's no way you can change that place. I mean, it's not like you can knock them out. You know, I used to be at a school that was a little bit lower down in the ranking, and the president would always joke um, about that. And I'm not quite sure whether he expected Harvard to fold at some point so he could move up in the rank, or his school could move <laughs> up in the rankings. No, we're not expecting either one of these schools to become any younger. Uh, <laughs> that is true. Uh, and if we can figure out how to do that, make sure you let me know about that, and that will work out there. Um, well, you, you have just arrived here on campus back in January of 20. 22. So you are fairly new to Annapolis and certainly to St. John's. Yeah. And, you know, I looked a little bit into your background. I mean, you uh, went to Yale Law School, which is, um, I imagine that's where uh, your professor your, was saying, yeah, we can knock Harvard down a little, a little bit. But you were a former law professor at Washington and Lee. And um, you were deans of the law schools at Hofstra and Washington and Lee as well. Yeah. And that seems like a big jump to, I mean, A, just the types of schools those are to the types of schools that St. John's is, and then jumping from law practice or being an attorney into being a uh, higher education administrator of one of the oldest schools in the country. How did that happen? You know what you're actually seeing right now in higher ed is a larger number of former law school deans. Uh, becoming college presidents. It's always been the case that law deans become college presidents. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Law deans, like Other professional school deans, but in contrast to arts and sciences deans, for example, oversee essentially a mini college. So they are in charge um, of admissions. They are often in charge of their own development office. The two things they generally don't oversee are campus security or athletics, for that matter. So you get the whole gamut of experience as a law school dean, just like you would as a president. So that's, I think, the first part. I think the second part is higher education has become a highly regulated environment. And so risk management and the legal eye, and what I mean by that is spotting a potential legal problem, has become so much more important than in the past. And so I think that's why higher ed is actually attracted to people with my background and training. Now, I think the other component is that law schools often think of themselves as liberal arts institutions. And the reason is that we train, essentially, or we try to educate people to have critical reasoning skills, to speak well, and to write well. And if you asked about the hallmarks of St. John's, it's to train our students, to educate our students, to get our students to the point where they think critically, where they read well, and where they write well. If I sound like I'm repeating myself, it's because I just did. You see the parallels between the education kind of at both levels. It's broad. It's actually much more interdisciplinary on both settings. And um, you said they're very different institutions. I would grant you Hofstra is. 
Washington and Lee, you start seeing major parallels. Washington and Lee is a residential liberal arts college, just like St. John's. Now, everyone at St. John's will stop you right now and say, well, but we're very different. Yes, of course. Our curriculum is intentionally not elective. The liberal arts colleges around the country are generally highly elective at this point. But many of the baseline foundations are identical in terms of what we are trying to help educate students towards. A rich life as a person, a citizen, as a member of a community, whether it's in the workplace or I think in society more broadly, with an interdisciplinary approach and an approach to managing or trying to answer the big questions that confront us as a society and as individuals, whether they're questions about justice, which is really, of course, what I care about very deeply, whether questions about what is the quote-unquote good life, what does it mean to be alive, to be a human, to die. All of these are the big questions. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, you look at any any type of level of education, and we're learning now, uh, as opposed to my generation, that uh, people learn differently. I know during COVID with the shutdowns and everything else in the public schools, they came out of that and they said, well, gosh, you know, we had some kids that thrived online, so they needed to create this online curriculum for those kids. And I think, you know, and I I don't want to be down on college because I do, I'm a firm believer in college, but what you had said, I mean, as far as, you know, for me, I know very many, very few people that actually work in their their discipline, and I'm talking on a bachelor's type of a level, you know, okay, I'm, I'm an English major, or I'm a, you know, a bio major, or whatever it may be, that work in their discipline. And really, it's the experience of college and the continued growth that you have, I think. And, and that talk speaks to you the way that you can read and the way that you can write and the way you can, you know, reason, really is, is the education that you're getting as opposed to that BS in biology. And, you know, I, I think that makes sense to, you know, formative critical thinking, form the opinions, be able to reasonably argue something. I mean, you know, that's certainly something you know, you know how to do in, a, uh, in, law, in law school. So I, I, that makes perfect sense to me. And I didn't realize that law schools were all sort of like little uh, mini colleges that are somewhat you know, related to the big, the big brother. And they, they run themselves. So that's interesting. So this is your first foray into the presidency. We don't pay pomp and circumstance or anything, do we? No, when you, when you walk I, in, I they hope, don't like I hope <laughs> not. I think you should be very down to earth about these. Oh, no, pomp and circumstance. Well, hail to the chief. That's right. Pomp and circumstance when you graduate. You've Although, that you know, higher times. ed loves doing that. I mean, there, I think there is some importance to pomp and circumstance in terms of graduation, for example. Mm-hmm. We should be celebrating people's accomplishments and the robe and the cap and gown. I think they are these kind of celebrations. It's not about the president. Right. They're really about the graduate and their families and having gotten to that point. Sure. Well, you've been here for seven months now, a little more than seven months. How's it going? Oh, I love this place. I mean, I really think St. John's is an exceptional institution, and I think Annapolis is an incredible place to live. And as you know, we have a sister campus in Santa Fe, which you couldn't pick a much more different place in America (laughs) than Santa Fe. But it's kind of interesting to have those two campuses to see different, you know, a similar curriculum, but some changes. So it's a very exciting place, I think, to be at St. John's at this moment in history, too. Well, that was one thing that I've always been sort of curious about. I mean, I know that the boathouse in Santa Fe is not really nearly as nice as the boathouse you have here. (laughs) But, okay, you look at the University of Maryland system or any state system, okay, they're, they're all the colleges and universities are located in one state. Uh, you guys are at polar ends of the country um, between St. John's. And, uh, you know, and essentially you're running two separate schools, correct? Uh, how, how does that all work out? Well, it's complicated in terms of two separate schools. So we've two separate campuses, two separate presidents, the same board. We're accredited by different accreditors, regional accreditors. Um, But some of our senior administrators really oversee the entire administrative function for both campuses, even though on the ground they're separate people. So it's a very complicated structure. And what you're seeing, I think, in in higher red right now is there's a number of colleges that are uh, buying up campuses of schools that are essentially going out of business. But those are all satellites, so they don't become independent campuses like ours does. So we really have a very exceptional um, structure. 
I think there was a management structural change to kind of consolidate some of the um, some of the administrative functions, like it, like admissions development. I think that was a very smart move on part of the campus to do that, and I think it helps the the, the two campuses function a lot more efficiently and effectively, and really um, help us manage our resources better. But I love having the different campus experience. I love having students who can transfer or who can take kind of almost a year. It's not a year abroad, obviously, but it's in a year in a very different setting geographically. I know you were joking about the boathouse, yeah. but literally to be able to climb up a mountain behind you versus to um, go jump fishing. Into yeah, Creek, right. Jump into College Creek. It's just so different. At the same time, both of these are capital cities. Both of these are very old cities and so there's a lot of different commonality and also major differences of course and I personally think if I were a student I would want to explore those sure. differences. Sure. Now when was the one in Santa Fe established? I mean, in the I'm late, assuming... 19, ni- late 1960s. Okay I, I, I assume that came later. <laughs> yes a lot a lot later. <laughs> That's 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 pretty amazing. What are your impressions of Annapolis so far? I mean, you're you're somewhat new to Annapolis. You know, I have to I have to tell you, I've been traveling almost the entire last three and a half weeks, something like that. I mean, it was coming back basically for 24 hours, and my first act's usually been to take our dog uh, down to the city dock. I just love kind of having the water and having that view, which seems to be a picture postcard view, sure. um, and. And so Annapolis is a beautiful location, obviously. I love having a second educational institution of higher education right next to us. I think the Naval Academy has just been a wonderful partner to us, opens up some other opportunities, opens our students to meeting other students. And um, as the soup said to me, there's a lot of preconceived notions on both sides. I'm sure, you know, what you expect someone's politics to be, their views. And both sides, I think, have sometimes, as they're meeting in seminar, been surprised um, that, you know, green hair does not necessarily mean you're an environmental activist. And a crew cut does not necessarily mean you're voting for a particular political party. So I think it's been eye-opening um, for both uh, sets of students. Very neat. What kind of important questions, though? What kind of dog do you have? We have a little Havanese. Oh, okay. They're... And he's my excuse to kind of explore town on foot. <laughs> but I think he wasn't used to living in a city, and he's getting used to that. He loves the campus, and he seems to be adjusting quite well to the hordes of tourists that are descending upon Annapolis on weekend. True, true. Have you found any favorite haunts for eating or drinking? or? Well, you know, we love crepe in our house, so Sophie's crepe obviously okay. are. A, um, a favorite, but there's so many great restaurants around and so many places to explore. Well, I'll tell you, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about St. John's. I mean, you know, I've, I've said it's a, it's a different school. Um, I mean, and, and you do things differently, and I think you you pride yourselves on that. Uh, yes, you don't have professors; you have tutors. Yes, uh, you know, you don't have the traditional classics. You've got classes based on the great books and yes. a lot a lot of reading. Um, what attracted you to St. John's? I mean, when you saw that Help Wanted in USA Today or where, you know, wherever it was that they advertised it, I said, you know, this, this seems like a place for me. Actually, um, I came across, and, well, I shouldn't claim credit here. Um, it was our son who was um, starting when he was in high school looking at colleges, and he came across St. John's. And then a few years later, um, I was actually talking to a classmate of mine from college, and her daughter was in Santa Fe at St. John's. And we just she talked about what an amazing experience it's been for her daughter. And then when the position here um, opened, she called me and she said, I should look into it. And so I ended up talking to her daughter. And I have to say, I have never seen a student that ecstatic about the educational experience. And I expected to have a 30-minute Zoom call with her. Literally 90 minutes later, my husband was asking me why I was still on Zoom. (laughs) And I hadn't even noticed how time was just flying. But it's such a rich 
experience. And in all honesty, it is so hard sometimes, I think, for people to fully grasp all aspects of it. I mean, we require four years of math. We require four years of science. We require four years of language, including Greek and French. And of course, seminar. Everyone talks about seminar, but very few people often realize that there is that whole other experience for students that goes along with being a Johnny. And so to me, that was really important to learn that part and to understand what the goals of the education are. And so I was incredibly impressed with talking to her. And I also have to say, so I grew up in Germany, and of course Germany is world-renowned for its research universities. In fact, the American universities are uh, patterned on that uh, model. But What has always impressed me about the U.S. is the panoply of educational institutions. I think sometimes we're hiding too much behind the world university and college because there are so many different ones. And personally, I believe very firmly in kind of the residential liberal arts model and making that available to all students who want it and who would thrive in it. And so that's how I came to St. John's. Well, I, I know a couple of years ago, and you guys, and I don't know whether, I, th- I think all universities and colleges were probably struggling with enrollment and increasing tuition costs. And, and I mean, it's, 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 it's a very difficult juggling act that parents have to go through. I mean, you mentioned you have a child that's in or is out of college. I've got three that have recently flown and grown. So, you know, I, I know firsthand that juggling act. And it's, uh, you know, one of the misnomers is that parent, people put the fear of God into parents about, oh, my gosh, how are you going to pay for college? Um, you figure a way out. Okay, I mean, I'm not saying it's not without sacrifice. If, if you want it, you'll figure a way out. Uh, that's that's my, my own pontification. But... Several years ago, St. John's turned around and said, you know, uh, and, and I'll paraphrase and put this in my own words, but, you know, we're, we're too darn expensive and we're losing good people uh, like the person that, like the student that talked you into coming here because they can't afford it. And you guys took a very bold, risky step to cut tuition. It was crazy, like down to, I want to think it was down to like 30000 not, not quite that much, 30, in the mid-30s. Okay, yes. 34, 35. Um, from, you know, I, I mean, my daughter, you know, when she graduated last year in her school was like 64. You know, but then that included room and board and everything else. But uh, it's just like, holy mackerel. Um, and you guys said, okay, well, we're going to lean on our alumni <laughs> and, and, and our benefactors and the folks that love St. John's and create a... You know, a, a capital plan, a capital fundraising program to fund the br- to bridge that gap. How how did that work out for for the school? Amazingly, you're absolutely right. Uh, we were kind of on the same trajectory as 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 every residential liberal arts college in the country, except for the academy. Well, yes, that's, that, I mean, the service academies are, of course, a different group. Um, and they're very different groups in terms of wealthiness of institutions as well. Um, and what we said at the time, you're absolutely right, is moving to a philanthropic model, meaning we have alumni outside support supporters essentially finance our students, and so we cut tuition, and we did. And what we saw is exactly what we what we expected, though every consultant in higher education has traditionally said not to do it, I should say that I think our model has now encouraged some some of them to change their uh, mind about that. Because what happened is that the number of applicants went up. Those were people who now dared to apply even though they wouldn't have before because of the sticker shock. Now, I want to be very clear, 35 is not cheap. I mean, by any stretch of anyone's imagination, that is still a lot of money, but it is certainly $20,000 less than other colleges are these days in tuition only often. And so the number of applications went up, then COVID hit. So it's kind of hard to say kind of long-term trajectory, but we've kept the number of applicants higher than they were trending before we did the tuition cut. We also started this $300 million capital campaign. Now, you can't see it from my window, but from the outside, you see the Freeing Minds campaign. Right. Now, we are still away, a year away from concluding the campaign. Officially, it ends June 30th. We're about $2 million away from meeting our goal. 
So that's the, one good phone call. <laughs> I think it's just waiting for a few people to kind of sign their <laughs> pledges. But that's an incredible result, really, for an institution our size. There are other schools that are multiple of ours, and they've run three hundred and fifty million dollar campaigns. Well, you're putting so, out what you're putting. You've got a, a total enrollment of what about nine thousand? Nine hundred. Nine hundred. Okay, yeah, so between so, the two campuses. So, so between the two. Oh yes. How many we're, are about, on this? we're about four fifty, four seventy five undergrads in Annapolis, plus the Graduate Institute. I didn't um, realize it was that that small oh, yes. here on Annapolis. I yes. thought it was about we are a less than five hundred mm. on each um, campus. We're a part of consortia for schools with less than five hundred. So yes, we are really a very. This is why our campaign is just unbelievable and unbelievably successful. Well, yeah, I mean, you're pushing out two hundred and fifty graduates a year, and. Uh, Maybe everybody you know contributes you know two hundred or five hundred dollars a year or something like that. That's, in the end, that's not a whole lot of money as opposed to somebody that's graduate. You know, the University of Maryland system that's throwing out you know what fifteen thousand a year. Yes. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. And then often, I mean, certainly the flagship schools have law schools, they have medical schools, uh, they have especially business schools, and those tend to be the graduates who are most at a position to give back. And so we don't have that. I mean, even our graduate institute is in liberal arts. But we've really, I think, attracted people who have seen the incredible benefit of this education to their career into their lives. And that's made them exceptionally generous to kind of make sure that the next generation and the generation after the next, because a lot of this money goes into endowment, will be able to get their education uh, here. Well, it does. And it's funny, when all three of my kids, they're just getting started in their careers uh, within, within a couple of years. And I know on day one, their colleges were like, hey, we want to donate. Wanted, and, and their initial reaction was like, are you kidding me? But over the ensuing years, and I say it's only been two or three, they realize the value that they've gotten from their education and to be able to give back. Now, certainly, you know, there are no Jeff Bezos that are, you know, <laughs> that are giving back all of, you know, to that degree. But at some point, perhaps they may be. I see it kind of in the way of what we want to create is a group of people who really feel that they have gotten an incredible benefit out of having attended the school. And they should give back as they can. And for some early on in their career, that may actually mean talking to other young people about the college, about St. John's. We know they can't give back money, but they can enhance the reputation of the school by recruiting students, by helping sometimes with a referral, by talking to someone about how they got an internship and how they got started someone. And it's interesting, I just met with a highly successful uh, physician, a member of the American Academy of Medicine, and he said to me, he never would have gone into science had he not come to St. John's, being forced to take math and science and suddenly realizing that this was really interesting to him. But then he married that with his interest in philosophy, does now very fascinating research on consciousness. But he said later in life, like 15 years later, as he's leading this major research lab, people start telling him about his leadership qualities. And how did they show up? Well, he would be in a room around a table, taking questions, getting ideas, and then synthesizing all of them. And he said, when people started pointing this out to him, he realized St. John's kind of was this gift that kept on giving. This was the seminar table, except now he was the tutor, kind of getting all this information and kind of formulating the next research question. And that testimony is incredible. Now, clearly, he has the resources to now make financial uh, sure, commitments. Sure, sure. But, that, but also, those stories are so powerful. I mean, that's an amazing story that you've got somebody that you know, that has really excelled in their career, that is at the top level of their career, in a career that most people probably wouldn't think comes out of St. John's, that had no clue about the value of the education he was receiving at the time he rang the bell. And, you know, it was very funny because he said to me, he was inducted into the National Academy in 2018, mm -hmm. and he was at the event. And another physician, another research physician, came up to him and said, you went to St. John's. That year, we had two people who were inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. 
which is like the most elite medical association in the country. Sure. So it's really incredible, and you're absolutely right. Probably some of your listeners are saying, she must make this up. I'm happy to provide the evidence for that. <laughs> but it She's is really true. No, we see, and we have a number. Of, we have one of the premier pediatric oncologists in the country who is a graduate. We have one of the premier addiction researchers in the country who is a graduate. So we actually graduate a relatively large number of highly successful research uh, scientists and medical doctors. Of course, we also, this year, this fall, we have two of our graduates starting at Stanford Law School, which is one of the top three law schools in the country by U.S. news rankings. Others would claim it's one of the top two. <laughs> you know, of course, we always have my alma mater in there. I mean, seriously, that's kind of where we see graduates now go, but we also see kind of the long-term incredible impact of this path. Well, I know some of the, the more, I say the more famous graduates, but some of the graduates that we know, Francis Scott Key. Yes. Okay. The uh, Penn who had a place up the road, you know, yes. uh, ultimately, but, uh, you know, Penn the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. Um, you know, you you look at that, you look at Ahmet Erdogan, who was the founder of Atlantic Records. Yes. Was a, was a graduate here, okay, in, in, in the entertainment industry. Uh, this I didn't know, but Lee Zlotop, who I didn't even know, but apparently he is the guy that developed that TV show MacGyver. Um, oh, I did not realize that. Yeah. And, um, you know, we got former Mayor Josh Cohen, uh, who, who was here for a, for a little bit as well from Annapolis. So, you know, I've, I've heard, the, heard it said, you know, what the heck do you do, you know, with the St. John's degree? And my father used to say that, it's like, what are you going to do with a liberal arts degree? <laughs> you know, I mean, the same thing. But, I mean, there are so many different ways. That, that you can go. And uh, you know, sort of going back to what I had said, that you don't necessarily work in, I mean, when you get into a graduate school or into a law school or a medical school or something like that, that's a little bit of a different situation. But when you come out of a, of a uh, bachelor's degree, the world is your oyster. And you can really look to figure out, I mean, you know, there's, you know, you just said somebody that had no interest in, in the sciences, I guess, until they came through here and was, hey, but what, what we have realized, do. and now LinkedIn is not a full set of our um, alumni, obviously, but as we were looking at people with a St. John's College degree on LinkedIn, what you would expect, a fair number of lawyers, uh, what you may also expect, a fair number of people have gone into education, different levels, different disciplines. But what you may not expect is a large number of people going into web design, app design, computer science in general. So you kind of see that there is a certain different kinds of thinking that really come together here. And I think that makes this institution so rich. I talked to a student who said she was contemplating about going into fashion design, but then decided that was too narrow but she still has her love for the visual arts. Then we have students who were thinking about engineering, but also thought this is too narrow, and this gives them a broader kind of basis. And I was talking to um, a data scientist a few weeks ago, who runs a major company, and he said to me, look, I need people who can think critically and who can read and who can write well and also speak well. I can teach you coding in eight weeks. And I think we think about it just the reverse. We think somehow, miraculously, people learn how to think critically. That no company will teach you because they, they don't have the resources and they don't have the time. And that's where I see the value of a liberal arts education. The other things, the technical details, people can teach you, and more importantly, they will change. I mean, anyone who did computer science in the 80s has no idea what's going on sure, today in sure, the field, sure. right? I, I missed that wave myself. I was on the cards, and it was like, <laughs> you know, AOL was about four years after I got out of, out of school. I was like, dang it! <laughs> no, it's really true. While thinking critically, writing well, that doesn't get old. No, and... and Critical thinking and, and, and writing well and speaking well, they're learned. They're learned through through doing. You don't, I mean, they're absorbed, I guess is the, what I'm looking for. Is that not something that I ever thought that I came out of my college education with, you know, critical thinking skills? I mean, it just, I absorbed it. it it's there. I can, I can have a conversation. I can have a political conversation with somebody on the far left and somebody on the far right and, you know, and, and reason with 
with I like to think I can reason with both of them and to be able to see both points of that and that's just so critical and, and you're so right in that people say you know I, I can teach a monkey how to code but I can't teach a monkey how to how to think and how to communicate no you're absolutely right and it's it's interesting because I think in our current political climate it is so important to be able to have an emotional response we need all that space but then really you can't engage based on emotion you have to engage based on reason and rationality be able to see the other side and I think also listen we had a wonderful alum who's a lawyer talk about how she learned to listen, which we all kind of tend to forget, right? We're all good at speaking, but sometimes not that good at listening. And St. John's forces you to do that as well. And so there's kind of these attendant things that kind of go along with it, but that they are so important. And you're right. Nobody teaches you. Well, Nobody teaches you that directly, and I think this is why every employer, when I look at employment ads, that's what every employer says we're expecting, and everyone says, well, I have it, but really, a lot of people don't learn it in a formalized way. You may still have it, and I think you asked me, you started out by talking about law schools and liberal arts colleges, and I think there you see a lot of that kind of similarity because that's what law is supposed to teach you as well to take apart arguments to put them back together and I'd say St. John's goes a step further because it really moves people out of their comfort zone and so what a lot of our graduates said was I became fearless because after reading Kant or trying to read Kant some of them <laughs> would say I've not been afraid of anything in terms of taking any text and trying to figure it out. We have this wonderful story of an alum who had become a very well-known reporter, I think Time Magazine maybe at the time, and the office said, well, we would send you to Paris if you spoke um, French. And he said, well, sure, send me, I speak French. He had some at St. John's, but he also figured he can learn it, and very successful. But so it gives you that, not, not hubris, but this entrepreneurial spirit, this courage, because you feel like you've made it through so much already. Well, it's, it's funny, in high school I took four years of Latin, and people were like, what the hell are you going to do with Latin? Because I didn't want to do Spanish, that was a, what everyone was doing at the time. And I said, well, you know, if I ever get an audience with the Pope, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> I said, but that aside, I can go anywhere in Western Europe, and I can make my way around. I can, you know, I'm, I'm going to find that bathroom. I'm going to figure out which way the metro is or, you know, and because of, of the language and the roots, again, it gets into the critical thinking and everything else to sit there and think that you don't realize what is, oh, yeah, I'm all muscle. Yeah, okay, I remember, you know, remember Doc Winters. He told me about that. And, uh, it's, and challenges, I mean, you know, we do ancient Greek now, although I did ask why we don't do Latin, maybe self-servingly, because I also had it in high school. <laughs> but I think to me also the power of translation, which has become such a big issue now. How do you translate things quote unquote, what does correct mean? Is it just the actual words or is there a deeper emotional meaning? Who should be the translator? I mean, we have so many questions right now and we address those sometimes directly, sometimes more indirectly in talking about these things. And then grammar structures. I mean, there's logic in language. I mean, all of these kind of things that we don't think about as we speak because it's natural. And, and, and you've mentioned a couple times too the you know the division divisiveness that we have right here in the world that we live in at this point the right the left the you know republican democrat whatever it is. And I was had lunch with my son the other day and I was saying that and he, he's just as frustrated he's 30 okay so just as frustrated with everything that's going on and we got into this big discussion and this is a great place for college kids to be at this point I say kids but young adults because and as cliche as it sounds I mean they you know they're the future and I'm seeing that they're they're upset I mean that whole you know I'm had enough and I'm not going to take it anymore type thing but I think this is wonderful that they're getting the critical thinking they're getting the the reasoning skills and everything else to be able to to go and to lead the country in different ways, whether it be in the medical field, whether it be in entertainment, whether it be in the politics. And that's a really, it's an exciting time, I think, to be in school. Let's face it, I mean, I, I, when, when Barack Obama was elected president, I said, okay, well, I said, we're done with uh, the old white man being president. I, I swore that we would never see a president that was 
elected over 65 or so. Now we've had two. Um, you know, so, so I was wrong. So, I, But I mean, there is a, a change coming about in the world um, with younger leaders. I mean, you look at the uh, prime minister of Finland. You look at uh, certainly in Canada. So I mean, we're seeing these world leaders, these people that are actually coming out of schools like St. John's that are leading the world. And it starts on a small level. I mean, you can start here as well as Josh Cohen did with the mayor of Annapolis, um, but it, it, it can move on from there. Prime Minister of Latvia went here. There you go. As, was he an exchange student or something? No, or was he? he was here for two years and then decided he wanted to pursue linguistics more seriously, <laughs> for, uh, you know, study of language. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing, as we start to wrap up, I mean, one of the things that I think is really neat and sort of a hidden gem with St. John's is the Mitchell Gallery. Yes. And that, I believe, is, and we, and we talked to Heidi and Lucinda uh, several, probably a couple of years, we'll probably do to talk to them again. But that is one, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's one of the very few fully accredited by the Art Gallery Accreditation Association on college campuses. And, I mean, they, they're bringing in world-class exhibits. And it's just such a hidden gem on the campus of St. John's uh, here, here in Annapolis. And I think that's... I could not agree more with you. And I am so excited about the gallery reopening when Mallon Hall's renovation right. is hopefully finally completed by the end of this um, calendar year. So let me say when I interviewed Lucinda, who's the acting director, was, I believe, waylaying me. I... I'm quite certain it wasn't accidental that she was in the hallway as I was just coming around the corner and she said, you know, have you seen the gallery? And I said, no, I didn't even know. And so she pulled me in and I have to admit that's when I fell in love um, with it. Um, it's been just so wonderful and such an important tie to the community. Now, you may want to wait with your follow-up because we have a new gallery director coming in uh, September one. Okay. Who has lots of arts experience and I think will marry beautifully our internal, what can we provide to the students with the external, what will we provide to the community. And I'm really very excited kind of about the next stage for the Metro Gallery because I would love to see us form a much tighter and closer relationship with Annapolis residents and Arundel County residents and of course um, the city and to me the gallery is one of the uh, Oh it's a lift it, it, it certainly is and I mean I know you're under construction with the, the key auditorium which is arguably one of the best venues in town uh, when it's, I, I like it because it's got a leg room so you can spread out a little bit, and it's got great acoustics there. You know, I haven't even been in it, so oh, you're way right. ahead That's of me. That's right. That is right. That's right. Qu question has been burning my mind forever, but does St. John's have a mascot? I mean, I know you're referred to as the Johnnies. Well, um, I wished I had brought, when we were in Santa Fe, my husband and I were um, there for a week to do summer classics, he actually went to the bookstore and bought a whole set of T-shirts for our children, including the one with a fighting axolotty. So a fighting the, what? Axolotti. <laughs> All right, we're, going, we're yes. going to Google and here. I will send you the picture of that um, because apparently there used to be a disagreement between Santa Fe and us as to what the mascot should be, but apparently we have collectively uh, gravitated towards the axolotti, which is this very, um, it looks like a figment of one's imagination type a animal, creature? which is so fitting to us. You know, you don't, you couldn't imagine us having, I don't know, a tiger. That would just be too usual. That would be funny. It would be that, you know, we would, could be playing against our own stereotype here. But no, so we don't have an official mascot. Um, but I am hoping, I don't want to say it's one of my goals as a president, but certainly it would be lovely if we could move in that um, direction. direction. Do you know yes. what the key school's mascot is? I do not. Different. It's the Obazags. Oh, interesting. Yep. And I uh, know what Obazag, what Obazag is? No. Uh, it's gazebo spelled backwards because they've got oh. that gazebo on the <laughs> campus. And that's, you know, they, they go by the Zags. All the yes. Zags. <laughs> well, I know they were founded by Johnny, so I right, guess right, I should right, not true. be surprised. Abs abs absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, let's get to the most important part of this thing here is, um, you know, you got the great books curriculum and all that stuff, but let's talk about croquet for a little bit. Of course. <laughs> You guys are dominant in croquet and humor, I might say, when you guys take the uh, take the pitch. We did not have 
any croquet in 2020 because we were in the throes of COVID. That was probably scheduled to happen probably three weeks after it first sort of broke out, I guess. The mids played amongst themselves in 21 at the Naval Academy. And in 22, it was a very subdued affair on the Naval Academy uh, with the mids and the, um, and the Johnnies. The mids ended up winning last year. But your record is still 30 and 8. Yes, and you know, I have to admit, losing to the midshipmen caused me concern about my presidency. <laughs> Just kidding. Is, is, is your bonus time? <laughs> you know, I mean, I should be, I should, you know, we should be beating them, and a number of alums quite here, here were we concerned about that. She's the Chet Gladchuk of St. John's. <laughs> of course, we did what one usually does, which is one says, well, it was on their turf, you know. This yeah, of course, was, it was a very close victory. Um, I have to say what was lovely about that, though, was that the students from both sides really Really seemed to be together. And there was a group of, of men who were uh, trying to wreak a little bit of havoc, you know, kind of getting our, our uh, players um, out of concentration and all of that. And some of our students went up to them and told them this was really unsportmanlike conduct. And they apologized. And they couldn't have been nicer. And then they, you know, then they started having a conversation. And it was just wonderful to watch that. At the same time, I'm entirely mindful that this has traditionally been a very big community event rather than an event between students on the two sure. uh, campuses. Do you know, I mean, obviously you can't predict the future, but I mean, are there plans to bring that back to St. John's in the spring of 23? There are plans for that and we are in fact I was at a meeting earlier where it was on the agenda we didn't quite get to that point in the agenda we have more pressing issues now with incoming class uh, you know the plans for student orientation and all of that but yes the plan is to make it to bring it back to our campus and to open it up to a wider community but maybe try to create it as a little bit of a safer and and more ruly uh, event than at least I've been told it's been in the last few years as, as we try to figure out how the hell to get out of this whole COVID mess and move forward with it as it as it looks. You've explored St. John's for the last seven months here um, and a little bit before, but what would surprise most of the people that are listening to this that they may not know about St. John's that you've, you've learned or what maybe surprised you about, about the college? I mean, I certainly think that the Mitchell Gallery may be one of those, like, oh, there's, there's an art gallery there. And, I mean, this is not just, like, somebody selling... I mean, A, I don't think they sell art. Um, but, I mean, it's not like somebody just hanging pictures on the wall that you can buy. I mean, this is this is world-class, you know, sculpture, uh, you know, paintings. I mean, it, it, it's this is... Every bit the art that you're going to see in Washington, D.C., up in, at the Philadelphia yes. Museum of Art, or anywhere, any art gallery. And we'll do lectures that go along with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're planning for a big opening of the Mitchell Gallery once Malin construction is over. And I would love to see more members of the community, you know, just join us on campus, whether it's the dining hall, the coffee shop, any of those types of activities. I love every day is how beautiful the campus is how historic it is. I think because we're focusing so much on our academic program, we often talk about you know 1937, 1938 as foundational years. But you're looking at one of the oldest academic buildings in the country with McDowell Hall. You're looking at residence halls that are 170 years old. I mean, those are incredible buildings. And I was looking at the, I think it was a map of historic Annapolis or a map of, of Annapolis. And like they had St. John's campus and then they pointed to the Mitchell Gallery as we should. And mentally I'm thinking, wait, you should also be pointing to McDowell Hall, which I have to confirm this, but maybe the oldest continually used building by a college in the United States. Um, So we have a lot of these other kind of things, and I have to admit, one of my hopes is that we have a few more plaques in the future, because we don't seem to like those. We also have right now, we have a gift from a world-renowned sculpture without a plaque. So there's a lot of things that we hide on Plaques our are campus. Good. <laughs> Plaques are good. I personally, <laughs> because you can reread them. You, you know, it's even if you've read them once, I think it's really wonderful to read them again from the Liberty Bell to other things on our campus. So I would really love to see us 
talk more about all facets of our campus. Yes, our educational program is, of course, the most important, but there are many other parts of the campus that would really be of interest to different people in the community. There really are. It's no, no different. I mean, it's a little bit of a smaller scale, no different than the Naval Academy. I mean, you know, they come in and there's plenty of places that are of historical importance on the yes. yard that are as, as well as here. And and again, the, the croquet, you know, on the lawn in front of McDowell Hall is... is you know, it's, it's an amazing day. Yes, uh, to, I can absolutely see that. And actually, what we're hoping to do is drive maybe some of the games over to this side okay. of campus because we have the flat, we have the flat green over here. But it also is, I think, the part where people maybe sometimes a little bit reluctant to go. I think what we're seeing is more people walking their dog on our campus. But I would love to see more people from the community just see it really as a space where they can participate, whether it's coming to the gallery, coming to a lecture on campus, hearing a music event on a Friday night, and really being welcomed to an educational institution. And I think that goes for all members of our community, but maybe especially for those who might be the most reluctant to come to a college campus. Well, I think everybody needs to come explore here. This is, uh, St. John's is a small yet powerful yet hidden gem here in Annapolis. Absolutely. I mean, we do, and we do offer our educational program in the form of community seminars. So if somebody wants to explore that, or if somebody doesn't want to go quite that far, come to a Friday night event. We just have a new communications director, and I'm hoping that she will make sure that the community hears about the things that the people we're bringing to campus, the conversations we have. We had last spring, just since I've been here, a really nationally renowned poet on campus. In the spring, we're bringing one of the top divinity school lecturers to campus. So there's a whole, and, and we have lots of music events, so there's a whole group of events that are going to happen. Well, and I know also when, when key, the Key Auditorium opens up again, you said that it's at the end of this calendar year, fingers crossed. Yes, hopefully <laughs> January will be kind of the... Uh, you know, I remember one of the last events they had here, and I mean, they have the, uh, the con- it was, I think it was called the Great Conversation Series, or the Conversation Series. I mean, they had um, Chris Wallace and Cal Ripken talking, you know, baseball and, and news. Yes. Uh, going back and forth. They've had, I, I'm trying to remember who else there were, but there was a whole series of about four of them that were absolutely fascinating to sit there and look at the two, you know, go back and forth. And, and again, it all ties in with what you're doing here at St. John's. It's opening your mind. It's giving you the reasoning and the, and the ability to, you know, figure out how we make it make it forward in this crazy world. And it may be through baseball or it may be through media, it may be through some other way. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. And we're certainly trying to bring, kind of bridge the divide to some extent or, you know, have people talk about things that have nothing to do certainly with the divisiveness in the country to get us all thinking about fascinating things that are going on in the world that we may otherwise miss. True. President Nora Demleitner, thank you so much for your time today. I won't take too much more. I know you said you uh, got off the plane, so you're probably a little bit tired and uh, you want to go home and take a nap and with your, uh, with, with, with your little pup or maybe a walk down to City Dock. But thank you so much for your time today. Welcome to Annapolis. I'm glad that you're here, glad that you're enjoying it. And uh, I look forward to all the great things that are coming out of St. John's and uh, you know, as soon as this construction gets underway and looking forward to it. Oh, one last thing before we left. What do you hope, this may be your forever job, but I mean, at some point, you know, what hope, What would you like to see in the Wikipedia article on St. John's College 70 years from now that says, when President Dem Leitner was there, dot, dot, dot. What's well, your legacy? I would like, I mean, there's a couple of things. Um, I would like us to become a bigger presence in the community, locally and maybe even statewide. On the academic front, I think I would like to become as a major player in the liberal arts world. I think certainly over time we've been profiled in the major magazines in the country, and I want to be sure that that continues and that we sharpen our own profile, challenge ourselves as we have over the last 80 years to provide kind of the greatest value to our students and really be an academic leader. But also uh, an important player in our local community. So those are my goals that, you know, in a more diverse world, we're attracting the diversity of the world to this campus and give an incredible education that really should be for everyone and that we want to make available and affordable to everyone and do that in the um, decades to come. 
Well, that's fantastic. Well, we're going to check back in that on 70 years, and we'll get back <laughs> to you. But thank you so much for your time today and uh, you know, inviting me into your office to look into this, this, this wonderful desk. Uh, I'm still in awe of the, <laughs> of, of the desk, but thank you so much. Thank you. I very much appreciate having this opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.